Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us in this webinar. My name is Susanna Ayeti. I'm the Agency Portfolio Marketing Manager at BCB and I will be your host for today. Today we will talk about the long-awaited Occupational Health and Safety Standard ISO 45001. To give us an exclusive look into the new standard, joining us is Mr. Chris Ward. Mr. Ward was an inspector with the Health and Safety Executive for 37 years. He specialized in Health and Safety Management System and has revised agency guidance HSG 65. Mr. Ward has contributed to the drafting of ISO 45001 he, and he continues to investigate accidents around the world. In today's presentation, Mr. Ward will outline in relation to the standards context clause how the global business environment will influence organizations as they consider the relevance of 45001 to their business needs. Using his survey data, he will explain the findings and relate them to this bigger picture. Remember that you'll have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the question pane of the control panel. Now we will turn the time to our presenter. And Mr. Ward, you may start the presentation. Thank you, Susanna, and um, good day to you all around the world. It will be morning somewhere, uh, afternoon somewhere, and perhaps evening as well. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to want to listen to this uh, presentation. Um, and as you see on that slide there, uh, will the world uh, welcome 45,001 or reject it? But what what I want to do today is to ask questions uh, for you to question yourselves um, and not so much give you the answers and solutions. That, that is not possible for me to do. Nor am I going to read out the definitions of context in great detail. But I will so that everybody gets to the same level of knowledge, show you a slide with the, the basic definition of it. So. Uh, Basically, it's going to be, I will ask the questions, and I think you need to uh, question yourself about what will this mean for me and my organization. Uh, and of course, you'll be thinking about it as we go through the slides, which will be available to you. Susanna will send them out to you, and they will um, have some notes for you. Not all the notes, not all the, um, the speech that I'm going to give will be in the notes. They will be head notes. So, how does the context of an organization determine 45,000 uh, relevance? Okay, it would be worthwhile just to bring everybody up to the same level of knowledge, just to give you an idea of the timeline of the development of uh, 45,001, which um, has a title, Occupational Health and Safety Management System. It is due for publication in June next year, 2017. That is the planned date of publication. There may be some slippage of two or three months. Indeed, it may not even be published at all, depending on what will happen in the next few months. However, that's the plan. Uh, ISO allows some slippage. The worst case would be that this could go back to the later summer of 2017 before publication. Before, before that publication is agreed, uh, a second draft standard will be produced. And uh, we got there January 2017. There's a question mark on that. Um, at this in this very week, the uh, working group who is drafting the standards have been meeting to determine whether indeed there will be a second draft standard or whether there will be some other way of publishing the standard or that they don't agree and won't go further forward with the standard. But the, the, the plan will be to have a, a draft standard. I think we're going to accept that that second draft standard will go ahead. And if it does, in the spring of next year, there will be a ballot uh, by the national standards bodies will vote for or against it and a decision will be made uh, thereafter. So some of you may well know and be familiar with OSAS 18001. This was the basis for 45001. And so it's uh, OSAS 18001 with some added um, value. And I'll come on to those added value and added requirements in a moment. This was based on 18001, which was itself founded on the UK regulator's uh, guidance 
Health and Safety Executive's guidance HSG65, which um, I first came across in my career in 1991, and I was in the audience, much like you were, when this was presented to me by some colleagues in HSC and became our standard approach to safety management. I revised that uh, publication, HSG65, in 2013 for HSC. So what you see um, in the bookstores and now I've, and download now was very much that. And so that was the first um, sort of widespread use of the safety management standard, HSG65. Okay. So, I, um, I uh, launched a survey earlier this year to those generally members of LinkedIn, some of whom have, may well be yourselves who uh, answered this survey. Um, and uh, uh, some of the results I'll be showing you now in these slides. But f fundamentally, what I wanted to identify is what was the level of understanding um, that uh, respondents had of the, over these four topics. First one was, uh, what do you understand by leadership commitment? And I hope it's clear on your screens, but you will see a red, um, yellow, and green bar. The red means I had little understanding, so the respondent had little understanding for red, some understanding for yellow, and uh, good understanding for yes. And you'll see that 60% um, plus had good understanding of what leadership commitment meant. We'll move on to risk. Uh, similarly with risk, most respondents had a good knowledge of risk. And um, the uh, fourth uh, bar there is on worker involvement. It, again, very good understanding on worker involvement. When we look at context, you see that um, there's only 30% had uh, some understanding and 30% had uh, good understanding and 25% had little understanding. So context was a, a difficult term for the respondents. But bear in mind, these respondents are, are already, in a way, a self-selected audience because they've come looking for information on ISO 45001, so they knew that there was um, uh, that it was going to be uh, produced, um, probably a self-selected audience because they're probably doing something like 18,000 or some similar standard. Um, so this isn't the world at large that's answered this uh, survey, and I don't claim that it is. Okay. Let's say um, something about the heading of this uh, presentation. Will the world accept it or re reject it? Uh, the, what I'm going to say is that, that the global business environment is very competitive and it is sometimes subject to criminality as well. So how can organizations uh, success, successfully achieve 45,001 in these circumstances? How can they assess their likelihood of success before setting out on the road? to 45,001 accreditation. And here you have an example of this self-selected audience, most of whom, for most of the topics there, are saying, yes, we're fairly comfortable with it. But the key one of context, key, uh, respondents are not very comfortable at all. Um, the, the issue about context is it's a self-determined um, barrier uh, and scope. Uh, the, when you um, want to implement 45,001, you decide what the scope will be, and that can then determine the context. So some or, so organizations, if they uh, are informed well enough, uh, can plan for success by limiting their scope such that they can manage the context um, and all that it will mean and the impacts that it may have on their organization. If, for example, they can limit the context so that they're only going to do business with trusted partners. So how, how did your organization visualize the context? How will you be thinking of applying it? Um, it you know, the, what, what I'm saying with all these questions or other answers, it's a, an opportunity for you to question your role, 
the business that you work in and the cultural environment to see if there are indeed any advantages or disadvantages uh, for you to either embrace or reject the standard. So, let me move on to the um, same sort of slide uh, and thinking now about these organizations. And I've said there's a self-selected population that have completed this survey. It, it strikes me that these respondents and the, and the world as a whole, or business as a whole, fall into three sort of uh, categories. And I've, I've listed them, the A-listers, B-listers, and C-listers. And if you're familiar with uh, stardom and Hollywood and film stars and so on and prominent people, there are, there are indeed the A-listers, the B-listers, and the, they don't talk too much about the C-listers. In, um, in this context of this presentation, I see A-listers as those who are keen to embrace the standard, uh, that they will integrate it with their operational system and um, integrate it with their other business functions such as finance and production. They'll be keen to promote the advantages of attaining, affirming and accrediting the status of the organization in accordance with 45001. But what about the uh, the B listers? Uh, they indeed uh, are those who aspire to forty five thousand and one, but they're not they're not the movers and shakers. They want to comply to a point, and that point would be profit motive, and there their aspiration to forty five thousand and one may take a turn for the worst. It may be those organisations who put production above safety, or not even equal to it. And so um, there are expressions like paying lip service to it or they want to aspire and want head accreditation because it means a badge, but it doesn't in actual fact mean that they deliver on their promises. Those are the B-listers. Now the C-listers, th those are the observers. They, they feel that they would um, like to look after the well-being of their workforce but because of the bewildering definitions, constraints, and costs, they will never be able to achieve it. These are the C-listers, and there's an awful lot of C-listers out in the world. And they're amongst the C-listers who wouldn't even want to aspire, or wouldn't even want to uh, um, uh, give priority to the well-being of their workers. So we've got A, B, and C. And you know, you may ask yourself the question, in fact, I, I, um, I prompt you to do so, where does your organization fit? What about your supply chain? Are they A, B, or C? What about your customers and your clients, the people to whom you provide pro products and services, A, B, and C? Because all these um, things um, are part of the context of to which you need to scope and assess and manage. I'll move on from that slide now. You probably have taken to heart all those, those figures. The, this self-selected res respondents to the survey were thus. And you'll see in green that just less than 50% of them were already using 18,001. Um, and uh, the remainder weren't. Now, it's uh, estimated through the British Standards, who publish 18,001, that about 100,000 organizations worldwide are working towards it or accredited to it. Uh, many choose not to work it to it. If you've got 100,000 organizations working to it, how many organizations businesses do you think there are in the world? I don't know, but I suspect it's in the tens of millions. So the majority of the world don't work to 18,001. Are they likely to work to 45,001? Hmm. Well, 18,001 is sometimes rejected, even though 
companies may want to work to a standard. They may not want to work to it because it's um, it's not an international standard. It is possibly in conflict with their own national standards. Many reasons why people want don't want eighteen thousand and one. But this is why I think standard makers ISO thought that having a global standard uh, removes some of the prejudices about using eighteen thousand and one, and also gives something uh, a standard that the majority of the world or the world standards bodies have endorsed. Okay. Um, what I didn't ask in this survey is whether organizations were already w working to another integrated management standard such as 9001 or, or 14001. So again, we, we can't really analyze some of the responses we get here particularly that further first slide, uh, because if they could know about 14,001, they should know about uh, 45,001 as well. Okay, and uh, again, this does not give any indication as how or whether their supply chains are in 18,001 as well. So we move on to the next slide, uh, size of organization. And this is it, an important thing for ISO and the uh, drafters of the standard. They want this standard to be accessible for small organizations, SMEs. Um, and when I worked with the Health and Safety Executive, we always wanted the SMEs to be able to understand the legislation and so on. But I think you've got to ask yourself, as I will do, is our, our, what is an SME? And, and does size of organization matter when it comes to occupational management systems? Now, for instance, if you measure your, the size by the workforce, you get that sort of data. But that doesn't give us an insight as to how complex that organization is or how simple it is, nor whether they're in a high hazard activity or a low hazard one. And um, for instance, in the financial services sector, um, with very, very few employees, um, but with a, certain, a, a massive turnover and a very low hazard environment. And they're the people that may well jump and aspire to 45,001, who knows? Or this uh, construction sector, again, could be a, a large organization with low school workforce and a high hazard. Or um, to exemplify that size does not matter in terms of employees, just think of a, a large factory with many employees, say let's say hundreds of employees, but they're all working on a production line and they're packing washers into plastic bags. Um, low hazard, big workforce, very simple management chain, there'll probably be a, a shop floor supervisor and the owner director, simple. It's a simple organization, but it's large. So what I'm trying to illustrate is you cannot go by size alone. So when you're looking at context and thinking about what your supply chain, or even yourselves, it isn't about size. Um, and so you can't then start to prejudice who you're going to work with by choosing on a size. You've got to choose by the quality, the hazard profile of that organization and um, how they manage their health and, can manage their health and safety. Um, so when we see regulators and ISO trying to produce guidance for SMEs, it might not be wholly appropriate at all because you could well have a, um, a really high hazard organization within that grouping. Um, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Let me just um, take a time to do that. So, what, um, what these people, respondents said, after having read the standard, because these, the serv 
people who completed this survey on my, through my website also had the opportunity to read the draft standard. So they knew what was in it. So they knew in general terms what to expect. So having read it, we'll see that hmm, just short of 75% said they would adopt it. Quite a large number of don't knows. I mean, there were some uncertainties about whether the standard will go ahead or not, so there might be one reason. Um, so not everybody's convinced. Uh, and you had a few who said definitely not, for many different reasons, no doubt. Um, and again, I sort of reiterate what I, I said a bit earlier. We've got a self-selected population saying 75% will do it. So it may be that uh, in the early years you get a doubling of those who are doing 18,000 to 1 and 200,000 organizations may well adopt 45,000 to 1. And the benefit of that is there can be this trickle-down effect. But the reality of the world is a rude it's a, a rude and rugged world. The majority will not be working towards 45,001. And here, the respondents uh, at, were asked the question whether it's relevant to workers, where organizations with less than 50 workers. Uh, and you've heard me say earlier, I've got some reservations about size being the issue or whether that's the really major concern here. Um, so I said I'd touch on the meaning of context in terms of the ISO standard. Um, and um, forgive me for just to have it going through these. Uh, but I'll give you the shortened definitions of context. Organizations shall determine the external and internal issues that are relevant to its purpose and that affect its ability to achieve the outcome of its management system. Its context means you've got to have an understanding of the need and expectations of workers and other interested parties. Workers now, definition of workers is change somewhat and you'll probably see it in the new draft standard and that means all people in the organization. There is no def, uh, distinction now between senior managers, leaders um, uh, and people who do the job. Everybody is called a worker. Other interested parties are those stakeholders who are outside the organization um, and I'll come on to some uh, examples of interested parties. Um, so, and then the organization has got to decide which of these needs and expectations become applicable re legal requirements or other requirements. The applicable legal requirements will be the domestic statutory provisions in the country in which the organization is operating at that particular time. Other requirements could be a requirement of a quality standard. It could be a customer client specification. It could even be uh, a country's own internal requirements. And um, you'll see a lot of this congru congruity and uh, a lot of common language with other ISO standards. Okay. Now we'll come on to some of the implications of context. I'm going to look at external influence, influences, internal influences, and global influences. So the practical implications of context. First of all, we've got to think about the geopolitical. We'll also talk about the geographical. That's the location in which you operate. The business environment and the implications on internal resources. And we're looking now at a real world situation. I'm going to on to be questioning and making statements about the real world and how it 
plays out in relation to organizations. So businesses have to respond rapidly to these external influences. They can be these four here. It can be economic, financial, uh, and, and legal, as well as cultural and social. And now the speed at which they respond will enable them to gain a competitive advantage. That's what organizations are going to do. This, the, this environment can buy uh, a cyclical one. Cyclical one, that means that there are going to be ups and downs uh, in terms of profit and loss. And that can be at both the macro level, the geopolitical, geographical, or the micro level within the organization. There's going to be expansion, prosperity, contraction, and then recession. Such is the nature of the world. So how can we as health and safety professionals help to manage that? See, and the drive to globalization is an expression of the need for organizations to iron out those fluctuations, for them to take advantage of the ebbs and flows of prosperity in order to offer to the marketplace the low-cost production of the product and the good value of the product to meet their expansionary and even their customer demand. This may mean outsourcing to different geographic low-cost supply chains and producers. Yeah, you can see in uh, how my thoughts are, are heading here. This poses the question of how can the end users of the product or those who are doing the producing control or influence the health and safety of their suppliers? Because they, they are a stakeholder. They have a, a genuine interest in where they're getting their products from and who's producing them and how. So even in affluent societies, there's a business case made for the use of migrant low-cost labor. This depresses the unit cost of production, but in doing so, it will impose a social cost on the wider society. It is an issue that Britain is considering very much this year, and similar countries as well. The, um, this means one of the costs to society is that the businesses themselves will seek to minimize the costs to themselves of training, development, and or higher pay. And therefore, there's a knock-on effect to the social community, getting lower pay, less trained, less, um, um, what is the word, a reliability and continuity of employment. So then, and then we have the geopolitical influences, that, and this can have a tsunami-like effect, uh, such as that which was caused by the 2009 banking collapse. So monetary policy, either by the banks or international monetary uh, agencies, will mitigate those shock waves. But the collapse in business confidence and sentiment can be devastating. So, for example, the dramatic fall in oil prices and its attendant effect on supply chains and its effect on government revenues mean there is less money to go around and it may cause a reaction by from governments to increase their statutory uh, uh, oversight and uh, requirements in their particular country and these are things that will affect businesses quite considerably. Now how businesses adapt to such rapid change relies on their having a, a flexible business plan forward financial planning and reserves, and a, a flexible workforce. Now, when 45,001 um, is being implemented and being scoped, I'm sorry about that. I hope somebody else is going to answer the phone. Um, OK, that's, uh, I'm sorry. I've taken the phone out of the room, but it's the base station that's ringing. Um, so, they need a flexible workforce. When writing the scope of, uh, for 45,001, these are the words that are all, all, also, also used in the scope. It's got, you've got to have a strategic plan. You've got to have an operational plan. Um, and you've got to have flexibility to improve and take, um, take opportunities to manage risk as they go forward. So, Having a financial plan to adapt to such rapid change is, is, a, is a foregone conclusion, but 
Now with an integrated management standard like 45001, you'd also need a, a flexible plan um, to, to manage the context of what of your organization. We mentioned the geographical location of the business, and this can have physical and environmental forces which will um, influence not only the location of the industries, for instance mining, you've got to go where the raw materials are, oil exploration, forestry, agriculture and marine. That's where the natural resources are, and it's quite often they're in frontier parts of the world with an undeveloped infrastructure. A, a transient workforce and the consequence also is enforcement by regulation authorities or uh, assessments by auditors is very very difficult to achieve and one of the things I learned after spending a career with a health and safety executive is if people don't think they're going to get caught they're not going to comply um, and so is a a challenge for organizations who are working in these geographical locations where there is little enforcement and little chance of being caught. So in essence the practical context of an organization plays a vital role in the practicability of adopting 45001. Now I need to move forward a little bit quicker now um, we're coming there are other global influences there's a globalization touched on that unethical practices these cultural practices corporate governance uh, reputation management and uh, employee exploitation this, this happens uh, in, the, in the Western world and in the UK, we're still concerned about employee exploitation. We've just brought in an anti-slavery act in the, in the UK. This is extraordinary, isn't it? 170 odd years after the abolition of slavery in the, in the Western Hemisphere. It's, so, um, reputation is, is very important for an organisation. It can be devastated by poor health and safety management. One of the, the things I said is surprising, we've got an anti-slavery act here in, in the UK, but what is, can have a negative effect is, is some, how should we say, good intentional, good intentioned legislation last month, they introduced a fair play and safe workplaces order and that in effect gives the government and public the right to exclude any organisation that's had a violation or an infringement and so as automatically if they've had a violation of infringement or have a safety or welfare or pay, they are automatically excluded from contracts um, offered by governments, they in effect are blacklisted. Now, blacklisting is, is good if you've got a poor organization, but I wouldn't be surprised if an organization that aspires to 45,000 or 18,001 uh, does have an infringement because it doesn't guarantee health and safety. Uh, safety management systems don't do that. So you could be a, then an organization with 45,001 accreditation and they're then blacklisted. Now, that's bad for the reputation, certainly. But it, it may be almost through no fault of your own. The second part about that is once you're blacklisted and resources are reduced, of course it reduces the incentive for people to improve. So this is where I say that those organizations, those statutes that are well intentioned can have detrimental effects. We'll move now on to some of the organizational influences, and this is these are the internal influences. Production and safety, yeah, client requirements, I think these are fairly straightforward issues. Resources, have people the competence to manage a health and safety management system? Have they got the competence to do the work safely in the first place? Are, they, are you an A-lister or a B-lister? Now, if you're voluntary, you're probably an A-lister who wants to 
uh, wholeheartedly embrace the standard. If you're a B-lister, you probably feel forced into it, and you're just doing it, paying lip service to it. If you're in the public body, private sector, different driving forces, public administration, they're not driven by financial gain, as is the private sector. Private sector have uh, shareholders, they have stakeholders, they have people who can influence the direction of the organisation. And there will be the system management demands that um, the organisation determines in its uh, scope and strategy. We mentioned that um, external influences. Okay, BP and and Halliburton, the contractors, they, they would have thought they were a-listers, but somebody in that organise those organisations said, "We're going to carry on drilling." we recognize as a safety issue, and it's a very good example of putting production over safety. But I suspect if they, um, I don't know whether they're 18,001 um, uh, credited, but they could, these are the sort of organizations that could well be 45,001, but do they actually subscribe to what they uh, and wholeheartedly um, uh, implement what they subscribe to? Um, this is a, uh, quick look at, this was uh, the effect on um, over half a million residents and people in the, in the vicinity of the chemical release. These are the people that you need to consider in context, the local environment. Bangladesh clothing factory, uh, that was tragedy for those within the factory. But their clients and supply chain were some blue chip companies working uh, around the world and delivering their products, clothing to some of the glossy stores in the Western world and probably in other parts of the world as well. So, client requirements on the production organization can have a big influence. And um, public concern as well. Um, this is one of the drivers that you may well want to think about increasing in the future about the sanctions. This company was fined, I think it was about four million pounds for a non-fatal accident, um, that was in 2000, I'm sorry about that, we've got a uh, 16, it should be 2016, um, they were found uh, an, an, an awful lot of money, that's the way it's going in the UK, so is it fear or favour, are these people going to go for 45,000, really going to be A-listers, or do they just want accreditation to try and keep the regulator away from them? Susanna, I think I've Yes, come nicely to the end there. I've gone through a little bit more quickly towards the end, but I, uh, some of the uh, points are uh, expanded in the notes that we'll be sending out. Okay, yeah. Susanna, uh, over to you. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chris, for this uh, great presentation. Uh, before we get into the questions, uh, I would like uh, our attendees to let them know that uh, uh, PCB provides training and certification services for OSOS 8001, such as Introduction, Foundation, Lead Implementer and Lead Auditor courses, and of course the transition course to ISO 45001. Uh, a PCB certificate will demonstrate your dedication in implementing and managing these processes and frameworks, and most importantly, you will be recognized worldwide. Uh, for more information, please visit our website, PCB cb.com slash training. Uh, now back to our presenter, Mr. Ward, the first uh, question is, uh, do you recommend hiring a consultant when implementing ISO 45001? Um, when I inspected for HSE, uh, many, a, many an occupier owners asked, should I get a consultant in? Um, I think the answer to that is, if you can uh, Im embed the skills and the knowledge and the competence within your organization, you will always be a safer organization. Um, consultants can bring expertise, knowledge, uh, and so on. Um, and so if that knowledge isn't already within the organization, uh, that might be the, the best thing to do, but uh, try to avoid a continuing obligation to a consultant. However, we've seen what the C-listers are going to be struggling with, and that's internal resources. So if you're a C-lister, and you want 45,001, you're probably better, wise, wiser to have somebody to come along and regularly um, update you and, um, uh, and inspire you because that's what consultants can do. They can bring in a fresh pair of eyes, different knowledge, 
um, and different solutions. Okay, Susanna? Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, what was the sample volume you used for this survey and how was the sample selected? Okay, the sample volume was uh, just short of 500. The range of um, um, respondents w was across the globe. I've got to break down, I know which parts of the globe had more respondents than others. They were those organized, uh, those individuals who came through my uh, AHS 45001 LinkedIn group and they came and I provided a link on that website to those members of the group to uh, complete the survey. So um, I think that sort of reinforces that something I said earlier and that is they were already interested in 45,001 so they weren't people off the street by any means. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, question. The, yes. Please continue. Yes. So I was going to say that if if people want to look on my website, the full results of the survey are on that, and the website address appeared in the earlier slides. You are correct. Okay. So now over to you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next question is: What is the best way to convince companies to implement ISO forty-five thousand and one? The best way is to persuade the president and the director or whoever is at the head of your organization that it is in their interest. You can go along with the, the strap line, good health and safety is good business. And you talk about the financial rewards um, and all part of the, that discussion also would be the moral and ethical issues about damaging work, workers' health. And then there are the legal sanctions. And if you're in the UK, you can now talk about unlimited fines and imprisonment if you get it wrong. Uh, and there are different sanctions in different parts of the world. But you've got to start at the top. That's the most difficult thing to do. Um, and if you can't get to the person at the top, you get to somebody who can, who's an influencer, an influencer in the organization who can convince many and then the many can convince the CEO. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, do you know what is the main reason that the standard is being delayed for? Yes. Um, the, there was a, a ballot on the first draft, uh, and that ballot was not successful. That they needed to have 25%, less than 25% of people saying no to it, um, and that ballot failed by just 2%. So it, Two, uh, two standard bodies rejected it. The main concern was that uh, there were 3,000 comments, and a lot of those comments were about detail. Um, some of them were about the definition of worker, uh, and that's been changed. Some were about the extent of worker involvement um, and what that would mean to organizations. Some were about the hierarchy of control, uh, and for those familiar with uh, 18,001, they'll know what that means, in, but in some parts of the world, hierarchy of control is not understood um, and not adopted. Hierarchy of control means a safe workplace. By not adopting for hierarchy of control, you get a safe worker, and we all know that workers will make mistakes, so it doesn't make for safety. So those are some of the things, and that is what is, uh, they've been reconsidering. Um, I'm confident because those are some of the issues that need to be that it's more likely in the second draft you'll get those several objectors moving into the um, uh, yes camp. Thank okay, you. Susanna, thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, there will certainly be early adopters like A-listers. How long do you think it will take A-listers to adopt the standard once published? Okay, well, you we can start moving towards it um, from now. Uh, if you've got a, if you got an achievement to 18,001, there are those three or four areas where you need to start developing processes and systems. Um, it, technically, you could be 
uh, accredited on the day that 45001 is launched. How far you are on that journey to salvation depends on where you are now, doesn't it? So uh, those who are not 18,001 doesn't mean to say they're worse off. They may have a better internal standard. Um, so and it depends how the size of organisation, etc. So uh, technically, you could be accredited on day one. Uh, I think uh, just to t touch on something about auditing, um, so as I know in the questioner is that ISO is going to revise the management auditing standard such that auditors in the future, when that's agreed, will be working to a common ISO standard for auditing. That is to help, um, of course, get consistency and so on. Um, but uh, in, in some organizations, I know auditors are, are, already, are being trained already to 45,001 with the presumption that what changes in the future in the second draft is not, not, not earth shattering and therefore we can almost predict what's going to be in the final standard. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the other question is, uh, there are many organizations who already have safety management systems in place and also other standards that to use as guidance in putting a management system in place. So why would, you, uh, why, why would one choose ISO 45001 over the other options? Okay. Um, if it's not an, an internal choice, we've got to look at the, the context here. It may be a customer choice. You may be supplying goods to a customer who specifies that standard. You may well see, uh, separately, you may well see a, a global move towards 45,001 um, and uh, wonder, well, why are they doing it and would it bring any value to me? Uh, so you've got to look at your own, do a gap analysis on what you're doing now and what 45,001 may mean. Um, it doesn't mean to say it's a higher standard than what people have. For instance, in Australia, I understand there's an Australian 9001 standard, which is more demanding than the ISO 9001 standard. So um, I think also, if you're a global organization, it would pay dividends as time goes by to have a globally recognized standard as that which you work to unless you can justify your own individual standard being higher. But then one of the great things about 45001 is you don't have to keep justifying to your supply chain or clients that you've got a good standard. If you have your own individual standard and it's not 45001, you'll have to keep justifying and showing them audits and they'll want to keep auditing you and they, this costs you money and then they will want to audit you again and that costs you more money. Whereas with the 45,001, it's an internationally recognized audit to a particular standard. So there are advantages. It may not suit everyone. And in, in, in some circumstances, the, uh, the questioner could uh, stay with their own standard. Thank okay, you. Uh, the next question is, uh, where can one go to remain updated on the timeline to publication? And you, you can ask your na national standards body um, if you can get uh, them to respond, but quite often the national standards body uh, in whichever country you're in it does not put out information. Even ISO doesn't put it out very timelessly. The best place to get it is on something like social media. Uh, both uh, Susanna and I manage uh, 45,001 groups um, and I uh, not to put too fine a point on it, as soon as there's any information that, uh, that becomes public knowledge, I put it out on my group. Um, and um, that's, the, that's the nature of it. BSI are, are quite good at putting information out in good time, uh, um, so you can try there. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to find the particular place in which it appears. So in much a bit so they have a look at Susanna uh, group or my group uh, and I Susanna manages a group which has got over 4,000 members and I've got a group which spe specializes in 45,001 and I've got over two and a half thousand members so EHS 45,001 on um, LinkedIn will find you a group 
Thank you, Susanna. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, the other question is, uh, will OSS 80001 stop being acknowledged? Oh, sorry, it was a little bit of a crackle. Uh, yes. Uh, will OSS 18001 stop being acknowledged? Okay. Uh, so, what uh, we on the co committee have decided on OSAS 18001 committee, as soon as 45001 is published, 18001 will be withdrawn, but there will be a three year period in which those who are already accredited to 18001 will continue to have auditing and accreditation and then that will be three years. It's not a transition, it's, a, it's more of a migration because OSAS 891 is a British standard and ISO is a different, completely separate organization. Uh, you, you don't call it transition, this is sort of a migration. So we've got three years in which to transfer over. Okay, so is that? Okay, so the next question is, uh, uh, who are the A-listers, C-listers and so forth? Who are the A-listers? Yes. Who are the A-listers? Well, uh, I have a wry grin. Um, they, I, I think you'd probably start looking at <coughs> those who've got 18,001. Identify those. Uh, and I should think all of those will go over to 45,001. That's a, that's, that's a starting point. But the characterization of A-listers um, is is you've got to be very very much people who have demonstrate leadership within the standard, both internally and externally. Um, they can demonstrate leadership without uh, safety leadership without being a standard accredited organisation, of course. But what we're saying is the A-listers really do mean what they say um, and they have this probably uh, epithet of it's not safety I, I, again in HSA I often came across companies that said safety is our pr first priority I said no it isn't no it isn't safety isn't your first priority actually staying in business is your first priority making money is your first priority production is part of that what you can say is safety is your priority value um, and then that can sit alongside production. So if um, the question is going looking for A-listers, those are that's the character of an A-lister. Uh, Mr. Chris, thank you once again for this presentation. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time, so all of the questions will be answered via email personally by Mr. Ward. Uh, thank to all the attendees for attending today's webinar. Uh, once you leave the webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation and we would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. Uh, on behalf of PCB and our presenter, thank you for joining us today and, uh, and have a great weekend, everyone.